Galloway, and the mother of all talk shows. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. Two and a quarter million people watched the mother of all talk shows in the last seven days. All are part of the show. Two and a quarter million. In fact, two million two hundred and eighty five thousand eight hundred and fifty five people. Weren't we the lucky ones? Those who participated, those who watched, those who called in, those who voted in our polls. Keep spreading the word because this is truly a global university. Mind you, you could have been watching the BBC, which this week reported a sighting off the British coast of a, quote, former Beluja Russian spy whale. Whether it's a former whale, a former Russian whale, or a former spy, what did it do? Resign from the FSB? That's the depths to which the propaganda machine in the West has sunk. But the good news is fewer and fewer people are paying any attention. The nation of the United Kingdom is riveted as to who knew what and when about a kiss and tell story of a gay couch television presenter. But sensible people are tuning in to the kind of debate that we are going to have tonight with Scott Ritter, the legendary military and intelligence figure who's just returned from trying to build bridges in Russia and who knows more about war than any of those currently waging it from the armchairs of the British television studios. And the balloon goes up again in Serbia where what a small part of the world calls Kosovo has begun to boil over again. Russia has pledged its absolute support for Serbia. NATO is flying in more troops. Well, the ones they had there got a bloody good hiding by unarmed, bare-fisted Serbian farmers just the other day. And we'll be talking about Roger Waters and the gigantic effort to smear him, which has been underway and which has so far failed. And of course, we'll be talking about the war in the Ukraine. So fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be, as Betty Davis said, a bumpy night because it is the mother of all talk shows. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. George Galloway. The mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway, the world is our classroom. And you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. How does a whale become a former Russian spy whale? Does it tear up its uh, membership card? Does it start speaking another language? How does it report back to the Russian security services? What were the circumstances in which it resigned from the service? Or is it no longer a whale? Answers on a postcard, please, or on the Twitter, or even on the telephone lines. I mention it only because it does indeed show the depths of absurdity to which the hysterical mendacity of the lie machine that is the Western media has sunk. The same BBC apparently alleged that Roger Waters had a balloon of a pig flying above his concert in Berlin adorned with the Star of David, the Jewish religious symbol. It was a complete lie, as a thousand pictures of the pig from all angles make clear no such horrific image was ever present in the auditorium. It is telling that such a brazen and gigantic and, I believe, grave defamation could be carried on the British state mouthpiece 
BBC without consequence, without an apology, without a retraction. The claim is still there, I'm told. And yet, in a way, we can be shocked but not surprised. The effort that is being made to destroy the reputation and destroy the career of the legendary Pink Floyd singer, songwriter, and musician is truly mind-blowing. It is Jeremy Corbyn to the power of 10. It is an international effort to destroy someone for no other reason than that he has dared to speak up from the considerable platform that he commands against pet narratives of the Western oligarchies on the war in Ukraine, on the attempt to invade and occupy and destroy the Syrian Arab Republic, and on the issue of Israel-Palestine. They try to tell you that Roger Waters is a fascist. I read it all day and every day. Roger Waters' father died fighting fascism in Italy in the Second World War. Roger Waters has written and performed some of the most magnificent anti-fascist music that the English-speaking world has ever seen. And that's why he's packing them out all over the world on this tour, and he's in his 70s. Sorry, Roger, if you didn't want that to be known. This man is an icon, a hero, a hero to tens, maybe hundreds of millions of people. In Sao Paulo in Brazil, they've just had to put on an extra night. So many people wanted to pack into the auditorium there. In Berlin, he performed a part of his show that he and Pink Floyd before him have performed for decades called The Wall. You get it? Another brick in the wall. It is an anti fascist parody, particularly appropriate in Berlin, of all places, I would have thought, both ancient and modern Berlin, both 1933 to 1945 Berlin and 2023 Berlin. But up went a hue and cry to try again to cancel his concert in Frankfurt. It failed. And Frankfurt turned in a magnificent, packed audience, not a seat to be had at any price, and gave Roger Waters their support. Why am I dwelling on this? Because it shows the desperation of the prevailing orthodoxy, but also how it is failing, failing, failing on every front. We're asking in the poll, is Roger Waters being smeared? Overwhelmingly, you all can see it, that he is being smeared. Why mention that? Because it shows how paper thin, as thin as a Belugia whale's skin, is the prevailing narrative in the so-called Western world today. Tito, in the chorus, the cat's chorus, of journalism isn't a crime. As they keep singing, every time they all issue a tweet about a journalist imprisoned in Russia or journalism in general, journalism is not a crime, they sing, these hyenas. Not mentioning that in a London jailhouse, Belmarsh Dungeon, rots. The world's greatest journalist, Julian Assange, another thing that Roger Waters ceaselessly campaigns on. But at least you could say, well, Julian Assange is Australian. He's wanted by the Americans. But Kit Clarenberg is British. He's a British citizen who landed at London Luton Airport 
just a few days ago. London in the grip of a crime wave where if you send your teenage children out on the street to buy a loaf, you're a fool because the chances of them coming back in a box or bleeding, having been stabbed or shot are so terribly high. A crime wave that the Metropolitan Police cannot get on top of. Six of the Metropolitan Police's finest Plain clothes officers, six of them, were waiting at the foot of the aircraft steps to pounce on a British journalist, a regular guest on this show, Kit Clarenberg, where they questioned him for five hours in an interrogation room under the anti-terrorism laws asking him his views on inter alia Rishi Sunak. Well, I don't know if Kit has any views at all. Does anybody even care about Rishi Sunak? Six police officers interrogating a journalist about his political views, seizing his property under the Anti-Terrorism Act, copying everything on his computer, his phone, God knows what else they did with it, interrogating him about his views on this political issue or that. Kit should have told them to get stuffed. They wanted to arrest him. Go ahead. He should never have spoken to them for five hours, in my view. But he's a decent citizen, was trying to be helpful uh, to the Metropolitan Police's finest. These people who tell you journalism is not a crime are seizing journalists. They seized a French journalist at St. Pancras Station just a few weeks before and interrogated him on his attitude to President Macron. Thank God they didn't interrogate me on that subject or half of England for that matter. What business is it of the Metropolitan Police? what Kit Clarenberg thinks about Rishi Sunak, unless, of course, we have now officially become a police state. I can live with that because I don't live there. Be a police state if you want to, but don't at the same time pretend that you're a free country, that you're a democratic country, that you're, in fact, fighting wars and getting ready to fight more for freedom and democracy. That just makes you a complete hypocrite, capital H, hypocrite. And nobody wants to be a citizen or even a subject of a country whose middle name is hypocrisy. The Americans have let it be known that they do not approve of American weaponry and war materiel being used by the Ukrainian regime to mount attacks on old age pensioners and people tending their allotments on Russian territory. Joe Biden said it was an escalation too far. Macron says, look, we need to negotiate with President Vladimir Putin. We live in a country in Britain, which thinks the opposite. James Cleverly, the Foreign Secretary of Great Britain, in the past a personal friend of mine across the political aisle, he stated in public, bluntly, that Kiev was right to launch military attacks on the Kremlin to kill the president of the Russian Federation, military attacks on the gardeners in the allotments, drone attacks on old age pensioners housing on the outskirts of Moscow. James Cleverly supports that in public. This is a declaration of war, James. As former President Medvedev made clear, this now makes you and sadly, us, 
the British a party to the conflict if it's legitimate to launch attacks on Putin in the Kremlin it's legitimate to launch an attack on Rishi Sunak in number 10 Downing Street don't you see the road that you have gone down and where it leads don't you see that it takes two to tango that if you've declared war on Russia they're going to declare war on you or are you too uncleverly to fully understand that now I don't want to see Rishi Sunak with a, a missile, a caliber, going down his chimney pot in Downing Street. No, not least because it would harm and kill uh, people I know that work there as police officers and so on. I don't want to see one of these missiles go down the chimney in King Charles Street of the British Foreign Office. Ditto for the same reason, and also I wouldn't like to see Mr. Cleverly harmed. But if you are openly, publicly exhorting someone to kill the president of another country, for how long do you think that other country will remain sanguine about you in your fastness in Westminster and Whitehall? Are we led by fools or knaves? And which would be worse? I suppose we could be being led by knavish fools. And perhaps we are. They try to tell you on the BBC that Kosovo is a country. But it is not a country. It has never been a country. It isn't even recognized by members of the European Union as a country. It isn't even recognized by some members of NATO as a country. Countries like Spain have got a problem with the idea that a small part of somebody else's country can declare themselves to be a separate country and get the recognition of the big powers in the Western world for obvious reasons. They never answer me when I ask this simple question. If Kosovo can be declared by NATO as a separate country, why can't Crimea? Why can't the Donbass? Why can't Lugansk, Donetsk? Why can't Kherson? Why can't Odessa? Why can't anybody anywhere declare themselves to be an independent country and gain the recognition of the big belligerent powers in the Western world? They can't answer that question because it has no answer. But the vast majority of countries in the world do not recognize a country called Kosovo, including the United Nations, doesn't recognize it either and never will recognize it. On what basis then are the NATO forces in what is effectively an illegal occupation of a part of Serbia. Kosovo is in Serbia. That fact will never change. And I know the Serbian people rather well as it happens. I've yet to meet a Serbian who would not give his life's blood to defend the sovereignty of what remains of the once magnificent, multicolored, multi-ethnic, multi-racial, multi-religious wonder that was Yugoslavia. Serbia is the last man standing. And if anyone thinks they're going to go quietly into the destruction of the small state of Serbia, they know nothing about Serbians. We'll be talking in the course of the next one hour and 40 minutes to two experts. Professor Glenn Deason is an expert on Yugoslavia, on Serbia, on Kosovo, and as I said, the one and only Scott Ritter, former Marine Intelligence Corps officer, arms inspector, who tried to stop the war on Iraq 
and who has in vain so far but valiantly trying through no fault of his own to stop a world war erupting over the territory and the bodies of the Ukraine. All that and much, much more coming up in the next hour and 40 minutes here on the mother of all talk shows. The 1897 edition of War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells, read by George Galloway, available only on Patreon. The cylinder was artificial, hollow, with an end that screwed out. Something within the cylinder was unscrewing the top. Good heavens! said Ogilvy. There's a man in it, men in it, half roasted to death, trying to escape. At once, with a quick mental leap, he linked the thing with the flash on Mars. The thought of the confined creature was so dreadful to him that he forgot the heat and went forward to the cylinder to help turn. But luckily, the dull radiation arrested him before he could burn his hands on the still glowing metal. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. If you've got anything to say in the UK or Ireland, here is the free telephone number to call 08081 9655522. That's 08081 9655522. If you're in the US and Canada, it's plus 18449443344. That's plus 18449443344. These are both free of charge. If you're in the rest of the world, it's 442039662625. That's plus 442039662625. The poll is running on all of our platforms, more or less. Is Roger Waters being smeared? A, yes, B, no. You can vote on my Twitter feed on YouTube if you're watching on YouTube on my Telegram channel t.me forward slash George Galloway or on the YouTube community poll, uh, which are all going great guns. Thousands of you have voted. Now, I've been trying to stop wars with Scott Ritter uh, for more than 20 years, getting on for 25 years. Uh, it's not going that well, but not for the one of both of us trying. Scott Ritter former marine intelligence officer, a man who knows the horrors of war, has just returned from Russia, where he was touring for peace. Let's hear, first of all, how that went. Scott, welcome back to the mother of all talk shows. More and more Americans, by the way, are uh, choosing to stay in Russia. I see uh, my good friend Tara Reid, uh, the whistleblower from uh, Joe Biden's private office uh, has now uh, decided to go and live there. Mr. Snowden, of course, the whistleblower of note who had told us so much about how the security state spies on us and sets us up in various ways. Uh, and, and some others uh, that I've seen recently, actors and, uh, and, and the like, uh, your re your reception in Russia seemed to be a good one. Did you ever think of staying? Absolutely not. I mean, the the, the reception, of course, was a uh, was very good. But I'm an American. I'm an American patriot. Um, this is my country. I love my country, um, and I defend my country. And there's various ways of defending your country. And one of the best ways of defending your country is to um, is to try and fix it when it's broken. And America's broken right now. But as an American patriot, my uh, my duty and responsibility is to stay here at home. And um, 
and try to fix that which is wrong, to try to cure that which ails us, not to run away. I'm, I'm not denigrating the choices made by others. Uh, free will is a thing. Um, but my, uh, my duty, my responsibility, my loyalties are to the United States of America. That doesn't mean that um, I can't travel to places like Russia, seek to reach out to the Russian people uh, to get a better understanding of the Russian nation, of the Russian soul, uh, to capture that experience and to bring it back to the United States in an effort, an uphill effort, but an effort nonetheless to um, try and change the mindset in this country about Russia so that we don't waste our resources, squander our efforts in, um, in futile and dangerous conflict with Russia where one, none needs exist. Um, you know, we'd be better off uh, turning our efforts inward uh, to, to fix the many problems that exist in this country and to find a way to live in peace and harmony with, uh, with the Russian nation, which is a, a great nation populated by a great people. Amen. Uh, where did you go and what did you do there? Well, the primary mission of the uh, of, of this visit was a book tour. Um, I've I've written a book, uh, Disarming the Time of Perestroika, that not only, uh, I think, captures a very uh, important time in history, that is the implementation of the first ever nuclear disarmament treaty, uh, the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty. And I remind people that not only did we get rid of nuclear weapons, but it was done in an environment that uh, in some ways parallels um, the tension that exists today in other ways exceeds it. It was a vein, you know this, George, you know, in the 1980s, how dangerous it was uh, between the United States and the Soviet Union. And yet through the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, through arms control, we found a way to come together and, and work cooperatively as friends even to get rid of these weapons. So I, I didn't, I, the book isn't just a piece of history. I call it a template of hope. When people say, how can we get out of this mess that we're currently in? I say, we, we have an example, my book. And the um, book was published in Russian by uh, Komsomolskaya Pravda. And I had the opportunity to go to Russia on a tour, an extensive tour, 12 cities over the course of um, 26 days and, um, and, and bring this book to the Russian people. And in doing so, um, engage in some very meaningful conversations. Uh, you know, it's not an easy topic. Uh, the Russians feel betrayed by the West. There is not the trust that used to exist. Uh, there's a lot of... Um, of bad feeling between the Russian people and the governments of the West. But uh, there's a, also a lot of um, kindness in their hearts and a, and a willingness to uh, to work with the people of the United States, the people of the West. Uh, so I went to Novosibirsk, uh, third largest city, gra fastest growing economy in Russia. If anybody thinks sanctions is having an impact on Russia, I'm just here to tell you that it's not. I, I witnessed a vibrant, vigorous, thriving uh, nation uh, the, the economic engines in full swing. There's construction everywhere, everywhere. Um, it's 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 a nation that's alive, that's thriving. I went to Irkutsk, uh, the history and the beauty of uh, of that part of Siberia, St. Petersburg. Um, I've never been there before, and every stone in that city is soaked in the blood of um, people who died in the revolution, people who died during the Second World War. It's a city that screams history. You have to see the city to understand Russia. I went to Moscow. I was in Moscow during the Victory Day Parade. It's not a propaganda exercise. It's a genuine expression of the patriotism of the Russian people. And that was made clear to me by what I saw. I traveled to Ekaterinburg, uh, a place where, of course, Tsar Nicholas uh, and his family were killed. Um, it's, you know, one of the largest growing economies in, in Russia today. It's home of uh, tremendous industry and history. Um, I got to go back to Vodkinsk, where it all began, uh, the the city where the, uh, the, the 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 arms control treaty was implemented, where I spent two years of my life uh, going there. Kazan, you want to talk about uh, some interesting, I went to Kazan and Grozny, two Muslim um, nations, um, and the relationship between the Orthodox Russians, deeply religious people, and the Muslims of, um, of Tatarstan and, and Chechnya are amazing. Now, uh, what, you know, they live side by side uh, with, with in, in peace and harmony. It's a lesson to anybody who doesn't think that Christianity and Islam can peacefully coexist. Volgograd, the history of, of that battle, formerly Stalingrad, to see the Motherland Call statue at uh, Mermayev Kurgan and uh, just feel the shudder down your spine as you understand the scope and scale of the sacrifice that was made by the Soviet people in defending their nation against the scourge of Nazi ideology. 
Uh, I went to Grozny, as I said, uh, to meet the Chechen people. I went to Sevastopol um, on Crimea to, to see that. And I finished up in Sochi. Uh, again, uh, Sochi, a, a city that has been, re has been built, redefined uh, through uh, billions of dollars of investment. It's still growing. It's a top-notch city. Um, and all along, I, I met the working class of Russia, the real, the real people of Russia, um, people that make Russia work. And we had frank and honest and open discussions. And uh, it was just a wonderful tour. I, I hope that I can do um, the Russian people justice uh, in, in the work that I'm going to try and do now that I'm home to try and uh, transfer mm. what I saw, what I learned uh, to the American public, to the Western public at large, in, in an effort to overcome the disease of Russophobia that seems to have gripped our collective societies. Well, you're doing it here very well. Jenny in the YouTube chat asks, did Scott get any hassle on his return at the airport? Did you? Yeah, of course I did. Um, uh, but I will say this. Um, it was expected. Um, you know, you, you, you can't be somebody with my profile, my background, and travel to Russia and not be expected to be subjected to, um, to some severe questioning upon return. But I will say this about the Customs and Border Patrol officers that I dealt with. They were extremely professional. They were courteous. They were cordial. And um, they were professional. And there was no, um, this wasn't, um, you know, something done with bad intent. They were doing their jobs. They did their jobs very well. And we parted on um, on very good terms. There's no resentment on my part for, for for anything they did. I mean, it was inconvenient to be held up for several hours, but that's life. Let's turn to the war. Um, the uh, the tactics uh, seem to be. I mean, the spring counteroffensive never happened. Maybe it'll be a summer counteroffensive. Maybe a winter one. Maybe it'll never happen, but the spring one didn't happen. But uh, new tactics were deployed. Uh, the Russians called them terrorist uh, tactics, and, and some of them undoubtedly are. They would meet any, uh, any objective criteria for uh, terrorist acts. Uh, and uh, the Russians seem, uh, I know this for a fact, and you probably do too, the Russians feel that the British are egging on uh, the Kiev regime into more and more acts of individual terror, which, of course, is ironic, as countries like Britain are never done accusing other people of being terrorists. There's no doubt that the, the British are playing a leading role in um advising the Ukrainian government, and in particular, the Ukrainian intelligence services on the, the conduct of this conflict. And uh, the British are specialists in, um, you know, playing the role of the underdog, that is to uh, be the side that has um, less power, but to seek to use unconventional means to maximize uh, potential. They were behind the attack on the uh, Kerch Bridge. Um, and they're behind the current onslaught of uh, drones against uh, against Russian cities. Um, you know, but again, they destroyed civilian infrastructure and they killed civilians. There was no military, um, you know, impact of these actions on Russia. Um, what the British, I think, have failed to understand is that they are giving Russia the green light to strike what Russia calls the decision-making centers. I, I, I just ask people when they keep telling me, Russia invaded, there's a war. Guys, there wasn't a war. There isn't a war. If there was a war, there would be no such thing as a decision-making center still in existence today because they would have been destroyed on day one. Russia has had a soft hand in this. The fact that Russia has had to increase the scope and scale of its activities is because NATO has made the decision to pour tens of billions of dollars of military equipment backed by intelligence, operational training, uh, planning, and British hands-on efforts to inflict harm on the Russian people. So there is an escalation that's taking place. Um, but just imagine if Boris Johnson hadn't flown to uh, Kiev in, um, in March of 2022. 
uh, and that the Ukrainians had sat down in Istanbul with the Russians on April 1st, as they were planned to do, to sign a peace treaty that would have brought an end to this war and allowed Ukraine to retain the territorial integrity of at least Zaporizhia and Kherson and uh, Donbass would have been on the table because it wouldn't have been absorbed into Russia. Imagine the hundreds of thousands of, of Ukrainian troops would be alive today, the tens of thousands of Russian troops, the tens of millions of Ukrainian civilians that wouldn't have been displaced, the millions of lives of the children. No one talks about the children whose lives have been disrupted. They're not getting the education they need. They're not getting the stability that everybody says is a example of a, a, a mandatory part of child you know, raising. No one talks about this. All of this would have been avoided had the British, the British, not intervene. The British government is soaked in the blood of the Ukrainian people. The British government is solely to blame for the suffering that's taking place right now. Um, and I think the, the Russians are getting fed up with it. They're tired of the rhetoric of Ben Wallace. I mean, if you want to talk about a man who is self-indicting himself as one of the most egregious war criminals in modern history, it's Ben Wallace. And, you know, one can only hope that at some point in time in the future, that justice will be brought to bear on people like Wallace and others who have been encouraging this conflict. I had hoped to tell little Ben that at the Oxford Union uh, in a debate where he was slated to face me, but he didn't have the courage to turn up. Uh, but uh, what happens next now in the war? Assuming no offensive breaks in June, uh, do the Russians relentlessly push forward? Do they seek to, as it were, mop up in the Donbass and entirely consolidate their control there? Or do they take the war to Odessa along the coast, liberate and, uh, and fortress uh, Transnistria and so on? How, in other words, how ambitious uh, are Russia likely to be now in this conflict, in your view? The longer this conflict goes on, the more ambitious the Russians will, will get. I mean, one of the things that isn't appreciated is the level of restraint shown by uh, Vladimir Putin and the Russian government. Um, you know, there are many people in Russia who are chomping at the bit, so to speak, to have Russian forces uh, capture Odessa, which they view as a Russian city, to have Russian forces link up with Transisteria, getting rid of that, um, you know, that, that geopolitical um, nightmare uh, to to capture Kharkov, Nepopetrovsk, Sumy, these other Russian cities to bring an end to Ukrainian oppression of Russian culture, language, religion. Um, but the, the the Russian government right now seems to be intent on liberating those territories that it has absorbed into Russia proper and focusing on that effort. Now, this is a very bloody process. I think the battle for Bakhmut proves this. Um, if the uh, statistics put out by um, Evgeny Prigozhin, the, uh, the head of the Wagner group that carried the brunt of the fighting are accurate, and there's no reason to doubt this, 75,000 Ukrainian soldiers were killed in that battle alone. Um, you know, another 100,000 were wounded. The, uh, the amount of equipment destroyed is, uh, is mind boggling, the damage, the destruction done to the city. Um, and yet yeah. that's just one city. There's, uh, there's still 30, 35, percent of the Donetsk uh, Republic, of the Donetsk territory, that is uh, in the control of the Ukrainians. And Russia has said that they are going to take that back. The Chechen forces, uh, the Akhmat forces, are being um, redeployed into this area to carry out offensive operations to continue that. So it seems to me right now that Russia is focused on um, liberating the territories of Russia um, and, and, and limiting their offensive action to that. But they are carrying out strategic air campaigns designed to disrupt any potential Ukrainian counteroffensive. They're killing Ukrainians by the bushels. And I don't say this with glee in my heart. I say it with all the pain that um, that must be mustered when you talk about needless death. But the Russians have said that one of their goals is demilitarization. And they had hoped to get the Ukrainians to do this in as less a violent a way as possible to remove the stain of NATO from Ukraine, but NATO has insisted on painting Ukraine uh, NATO blue and white. And so the de-NATO, 
you know, the denatoizing process is going to be very bloody. It means the physical destruction of the Ukrainian army, and that's happening. There's another aspect of it, which is denazification. And uh, I think this is going to require the collapse of the Ukrainian government, but Putin doesn't seem to have committed to this, that there is still the potential, at least it appears, for a negotiated settlement if Ukraine is willing to accept the reality of uh, what Russia has accomplished. My concern is that the West won't allow Ukraine to accept this reality and that this war, which should come to an end in late summer, early August, which is the, the time where I believe the Ukrainian armed forces will have um, exceeded their ability to sustain this conflict. Uh, but if it doesn't and it continues, I think that the next phase will be Vladimir Putin giving the green light for further acquisition of Ukrainian territory. But right now, as things stand, I believe the Russians are willing to accept a peace settlement, a termination of this conflict that limits Russian territorial gains to Kherson, Zaporizhia, Donetsk, Lugansk, and Crimea. Well, they're having a peace summit in Paris. The only problem is Russia isn't invited to it. How can you have a peace summit during a war uh, when one of the parties to the war is, uh, is not wanted uh, on voyage? Well, I think what this proves is that there is a split between the Ukrainian government and, um, and its NATO and European supporters. Um, this conflict is unwinnable. NATO now realizes that. They realize that their investment is in vain and that if they continue to go down the path that the trajectory of this conflict is taking, that Russia will succeed in not only destroying the Ukrainian army, but destroying the bulk of NATO's military infrastructure, especially that which has been given to Ukraine. Um, and so in order to avoid this uh, scenario, I think that there's pressure being placed on the Ukrainian government to come up with, um, uh, to accept uh, Russia's terms, to limit the damage that's done not only to Ukraine, but also to uh, to NATO in terms of reputation and in terms of capacity to, uh, to wage war. So I think that's the scope and scale of the peace summit. It's an internal dialogue between Ukraine and the West. Uh, and, you know, Russia will uh, will be part of this process once Ukraine and the West can agree on, um, you know, what what peace should look like. It'll be there like Banco's ghost uh, hovering over the table. Scott Ritter, good to have you back uh, on this side of the world, our side of the world, if only we could be more proud of our side of the world. But we're proud of you. Thank you for joining us on the mother of all talk shows, as always. Uh, the uh, poll is Roger Waters being smeared. A, yes, 88% on Twitter, 95% on YouTube, 97% on Telegram, and 95% on the YouTube community poll. This means that 12% say he's not being smeared on Twitter, 5% on YouTube, 3% on Telegram, 5% on the YouTube community poll. So I invite anyone who voted no to call me now, 0808196552 and have your say. And if you're in the US or Canada, plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. Let me take a quick break and then it's your calls. Donald is in Inverness on Assange. Go ahead, Donald. Hi, George. Good to hear from you again. I'm, I'm phoning Hi. about Assange, but really your audience is highly privileged to benefit from your international research. I mean, I've learned, I mean, tonight you, you told us about the misfired missile and the helicopter crash. We'll never hear that on mainstream news. Last time, sure. Gonzalo Lira told us about Poland doubling his armed forces. These are very important pieces of information. Now, information is one thing, but what I want to do, George, is I want to raise the topic of conscience. 
But I want to illustrate it with a, an incident that I saw in a documentary in Second World in World War Two. A, a, a U.S. soldier called Glenn Fraser had a Japanese officer's sword at his head, uh, ready to chop it off to make him an example to others. And he was told that he would die for having his hands in his pockets in the cold weather. And did he have any last words to say? So this uh, uh, Fraser looked the fellow, this is the Japanese officer, looked him in the eye. And he told the Japanese officer that he could kill him. But he says, you cannot kill my spirit. He says, and my spirit will lodge in your body and hunt you until the day you die. Very powerful, uh, Donald. I, I too, like you, uh, believe in the judgment day. I believe in the afterlife. I believe that we will reap what we sow. And I agree entirely with the point you make about conscience. I put it this way, that my conscience is my daily communion with God. And if I follow my conscience, I won't do wrong. And if we all reawaken our conscience, as you beautifully put it, uh, then we will have no need for policing. We'll certainly have less need for policing. And heaven knows we could do with that. You know that they speak the best English in the world, in Inverness? And Donald is a good example of it. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. From Inverness to Aberdeen, where Chris is there on the line wanting to talk about the Ukraine war. Chris. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. What would you like to say? Thanks for having me on, George. Um, to be America's enemy is dangerous. To be their friend can be fatal. You're either with us or yes. you're against us. I think that Europe yes. is about to find out that at least the first one of those statements is true. And Europe is about to be thrown under the bus as Russia increasingly asserts its authority over uh, Ukraine. I see today that um, they said they destroyed the last Ukrainian ship in Odessa uh, and that the, the Ahmad troops of Chechnya were advancing in the Donbass. I think that the West realizes full well now that the, the game is up. And they're starting to ramp up their efforts in places like Kosovo and Bosnia, where I hear there was an American uh, bomber flying over. So I think that we're going to see that increasingly grow and escalate as uh, as in coming weeks. In the coming weeks, and I also think that um, in their desperation to frame Russia for anything, I hear, uh, saw it today, uh, Ursula, Ursula, what's her name, Van der Leyen, um, screeching that Russia had broken the Minsk, Minsk agreements, a complete opposite of what actually happened. Uh, now, I, I think that they're going to increase, I think you'll start to see terrorist attacks in the west of Europe as they try to get the West involved. I heard Douglas McGregor saying a couple of weeks ago that uh, Soros has actually written a paper, too, talking about the importance of getting the Eastern European intermarium countries involved in the conflict, but he didn't think at that time that he could get the West involved. Now, the only way they can do that is to uh, increase their incidence of terrorism. Uh, Macron, I believe, uh, had said a wee while ago that, um, you know, there was a danger of ISIS terrorism in Europe. So I think we should be prepared to see that. Uh, and as more and more Europe is just driven into the complete doldrums and uh, destroyed economically. Yeah, all, all the while, uh, yeah, all the while uh, our economies are sinking fast into the quicksand uh, of, uh, of recession, even depression. 
uh, Germany in particular, uh, the powerhouse of the European economy when it catches cold, uh, the rest of Europe catches influenza. Uh, well, Germany has got influenza, so what does that mean the rest of Europe will now have and suffer? And although the weather is fine now, it soon will not. Uh, the I could, if I wanted, calculate uh, on on one hand, uh, the number of months before the heating will need to be back on and the energy crisis uh, that has been caused by the self-harm of sanctions and the blowing up by the United States and its allies of Nord Stream 2 uh, will again begin to bite. Great call, Chris, in Aberdeen. Thank you. Jim is in Colorado on U.S. aggression. Go ahead, Jim. Uh, hi, George. Um, I was just reading hi. an article about um, the the history of the, our problems here in, in the Ukraine or Russia's problems in the Ukraine. Joe Biden gave a speech in 2009, right after he became vice president, it was something called the Munich Security Conference. And he said, we yes. will not recognize any nation having a sphere of influence. And I said, to, you know, I just, it struck me right between the eyes. I said, I can't believe this. You might as well say, let's have World War Three now. Um, and I was so incensed, I wanted to make sure this really happened as much as I could. So I did a search on that quote. And the White House 2009 homepage came up. And sure enough, there was this speech given at this conference. And you have to figure that Hillary was down with this. She was a secretary of state and Obama himself. So now we have the U.S. just telling the whole world, we run it. <laughs> and, you know, no sphere of influence. Yeah, uh, that, they, well, exactly. Uh, apart from the Monroe Doctrine, apart from the right of the United States to fly surveillance planes over China, which happened this week. Uh, I mean, in a way, it's funny, Jim. The pilots of the American surveillance plane flying along the Chinese border were condemning the aggressive tactics of the Chinese fighter jets that had been scrambled to push them away from... Uh, Chinese waters. And I got to thinking, you know, why is there an American surveillance plane flying along the border of uh, China? Is China, look at the trouble with, the, with a weather balloon, not, not a, a surveillance air force uh, plane armed to the teeth, no doubt, uh, but a weather balloon, which may not even have been Chinese, a balloon. The whole of America was turned upside down over that balloon. And yet, they're shocked when China responds to uh, the presence of an American surveillance. Do you think our leaders just, they don't even know, they don't know how hypocritical they're being? Or have they no conscience? Uh, are they stupid or are they wicked? This is always my question, Jim. I can't figure out if they're stupid, they're just out to lunch, or they think the people are stupid. So they can make a big deal of a plane flying over, <laughs> of a balloon flying over, you know, the country that who knows what, what it was and, and who really cares. It, it wasn't a missile. So, yeah, we never, you know, we so never did hear, we never did hear no. uh, what was it. They, they collected its remnants, but they never showed them right. to us. Uh, one no. can only infer if one has any brains at all that there was nothing to show. Yeah, they probably have it down in New Mexico with the, the dead bodies of the Martians or whatever. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, but there is no, some good news. Now you're on to something. <laughs> yeah, go on. There's some good news. There's people demonstrating outside of Chuck Schumer's house over this deal that was signed on the budget, uh, mostly uh, allowing this this pipeline to go under the Appalachian uh, Mountains and have no, um, no, you can't protest any of the um, the dirty uh, 
setups that they're going to do, and then they're, they're not complying with any of the codes for the, this this pipeline. And uh, this is a gift from Joe Manchin put in via this budget deal. Well, there you go. Uh, There you go, Jim in Colorado, bringing us up to date with a demonstration outside uh, an American politician's home, Chuck Schumer, the leader of the Republican majority. Uh, the best super chat so far is from Doc Jazz, who sends his usual 50 dirhams. God bless both you and Roger Waters for your courage and for speaking truth to power. Both of you are diehard friends of Palestine and among our people. You are widely loved and admired. Thank you, Doc, for that. Erwin is in San Diego. Let's hear from him. Erwin, welcome to the show. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Holloway. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I am uh, 80 years old, uh, living in, here in San Diego, California. And thank you very much for your brilliant and so unique, spectacular world show. We are living in a very difficult, challenged times and with a lot of changes. How do you see this world you know, for the next 10 years, Mr. Holloway? I honestly wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't prophesy 10 years. Uh, I'd struggle to prophesy the next 10 days. Uh, I, I think we're living in an extremely perilous uh, place and time. Uh, and in my lifetime, there has never been a more perilous time. Uh, even the Cuban Missile Crisis, even the height or depth of the Cold War, was nothing like this. Uh, in our own countries, uh, we had certain freedoms and social organization which we no longer have. There are no countervailing forces worth speaking of uh, in the Western countries, yours, mine, uh, everywhere except France, I would say. Uh, so the rulers who are smaller and more stupid than they were back then uh, are able to do as they will. They are able to see their own economy collapsing, their people unable to pay for their energy and their food bills, their people crying, some of their children hungry and yet handing over hundreds of billions of dollars uh, to a coup regime in Kiev that is a monster created by them in the first place back in 2014 and nobody does anything about it. In the British Parliament there is not a single, I stress that, not a single member of Parliament opposing uh, the British government's attitude to the war and to our money. In America it's very slightly better uh, but the only people who are opposing the official narrative and the official action are people on the right of politics, not just in the Republican Party, but on the right of the Republican Party. The rest of the Republican Party and all of the Democratic Party, including its so-called left, are all gung-ho for NATO and the war. None of these things were true before, uh, even in the, in the Cold War. There were always uh, big figures in the British Parliament uh, standing up uh, against the war drive, standing up against the Cold War, uh, confronting the false, fake narratives of our rulers. But that is no longer true. In the past, even the recent past, by which I mean 20 years ago, uh, someone like me would have been on uh, the so-called mainstream television Daily, daily. Given how strong my views are on Kosovo, on Serbia, on Russia, on Ukraine, and so on, if this was 20 years ago, I would be on national television every single day uh, because they then felt they had an obligation to reflect all the views that existed in the society about the big issues of the day. But 20 years later, it is unalloyed, unabated, remorseless, lying, 
a giant lie machine where even Baluja whales get recruited to the Russian intelligence services. I'll be right back. After this four-minute videotape that I made, I think a year ago, with my good wife, Gayatri, and Gayatri suggested 30 hours ago, let's put that video out again. Since when, more than half a million people in 30 hours have watched it. Take a look. They were partying like it was 1999. In fact, it was in 1999 when peaceful NATO were partying here in a European capital, the city of Belgrade. They tell you that NATO is a defensive organization. Tell that to the people of former Yugoslavia. Tell that to the people of Belgrade. For almost three months, uh, they were bombing and killing here in the heart of Europe. NATO is, as it has always been, a front for the American Empire. If you're supporting it, you're acting against the interests of the people of Europe. You're acting in the interests of the continuing domination of the globe by the United States of America. They even bombed the Chinese embassy here in 1999. They silenced the television station, not by ordinance, but yes, by ordinance of the exploding kind. They killed 16 employees of the state radio and television, the equivalent of the BBC in Belgrade, including makeup ladies and tea ladies. They did so in order to complete the destruction and the dismemberment of the former Socialist Republic of Yugoslavia. Nobody much said or did anything against it in Britain or in Europe as a whole. Myself, in Parliament, it's a period of which I'm inordinately proud. Under the leadership of the late Mr. Ben, Tony Ben, the greatest Prime Minister we never had, we fought a rear guard action in Parliament against the destruction of Yugoslavia. We failed, like we failed again just a few years later in Iraq. But the world has changed. Nobody can bomb a Chinese embassy now. Nobody can stand up to the new Eurasian development which is taking place on this planet, where most of the people and most of the wealth of the planet resides. We're in a new world. It's just not the new world order that the so-called West, which is, I remind you, just 10% of the world's population, think or thought that it was going to be. Their new world order has been still born. A better world order, a more just world order, is in the process of being born. But these are useful reminders of just exactly the nature of the beast that is NATO. We're here in Belgrade and we can say these things without fear of seizure of our assets, without fear of imprisonment, seven years in prison. If I was to say what I've just said through the mediums that would reach a large number of people, I could end up next door to Julian Assange. Just think. Well, that was made by my good wife. The sound, the camera, the setup, everything. The talking was by me. 
uh, so it was a mom and pop film and it's turned out to be one of the most watched things I have ever done so thank you to everyone who appreciated it. Our next guest is Professor Glenn Deeson who is a professor at the University of Southeastern Norway and the editor at Russia in Global Affairs. Uh, I've spoken to Glenn many times. He's a very learned man and his uh, compass uh, of understanding is second to none in European academia, in my view. And so when the NATO uh, Kosovan Serbian rumpus began this week, I knew that we really had to find Glenn to hear uh, the truth and the background uh, to where we are now. And we are, perhaps more importantly, this is all going to go. So Professor Glenn Deeson, thank you for joining us again on the Mother of All Talk Shows. Uh, let's start with, if we can, uh, how we got here. Uh, Many people will be surprised that with NATO's many duties around the world, from the South China Sea uh, to Colombia, uh, that there's uh, hundreds of them in a tiny protectorate, for that's what it is, uh, called Kosovo, which is part of Serbia, and that they're there against the wishes of the Serbian government and people. Explain that conundrum, if you will. Well, it's been a uh, well. First of all, let me say, yeah, good to see you again, George, and thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, uh, well, the, this whole story began with the NATO's illegal invasion of Yugoslavia in 1999. Um, they, when they invaded uh, without a UN mandate, uh, because they argued that Chinese and Russians were threatening with a veto, which meant that they could override the United Nations. Um, so uh, also it's worth noting that even Henry Kissinger uh, pointed out that uh, uh, NATO was looking for an excuse to bomb by effectively giving, uh, well, sabotaging their own uh, uh, peace accords with the Serbs. Uh, anyways, after the invasion, uh, the, the yeah, NATO set up uh, yeah, Kosovo more or less as a protectorate. Uh, they were able to get some legitimacy, legitimacy for it, though, uh, by getting a, a UN mandate, which was 1244. Uh, and this uh, uh, and this was uh, still what NATO refers to as its uh, legality for being there. However, uh, this mandate recognized the territorial integrity of Yugoslavia, which is now Serbia. So, But what happened over the next year since 1999 was uh, uh, the, the Serbian population in uh, Kosovo was largely ethnically cleansed. They were all pushed out, uh, except for the north. In the north of Kosovo, uh, it's still a Serb majority, and uh, <clears throat> and this uh, and this has been uh, well what NATO sees as a challenge, because uh, uh, NATO then illegally recognized the independence of Kosovo in 2008. They still rely on the mandate 1244, which recognizes the territorial integrity of Serbia, but nonetheless they have violated that mandate themselves. So anyways, uh, over the next few years, uh, the EU attempted to normalize relations between Serbia and Kosovo, which Serbia and the UN doesn't recognize as a state, uh, which was in 2013. And this is uh, part of the format was to have this uh, community of the Serbian uh, municipalities in northern Kosovo. Uh, however, a decade later, uh, the government in Pristina never implemented the agreement and uh, has been trying to cement its control over the north, which of course the Serbs would fear. Uh, and uh, yeah, that brings us to the conflict we're currently at. Exactly. Uh, and uh, you and I both know the Serbian people. Uh, when uh, Djokovic wrote on uh, the front of a television camera, uh, Serbia's, uh, Kosovo is the heart of Serbia, uh, he meant it, and all Serbs mean it. They cannot possibly allow further dismemberment of what is now merely a rump of what once was Yugoslavia. No, and that's also been part of the, uh, the strange position of, of NATO, because the NATO forcefully uh, took uh, Kosovo from Serbia, which was... Uh, uh, well, the first time after the Second World War, we changed the European borders by force. 
Uh, but uh, when we speak of the northern parts of Kosovo, uh, the NATO countries have been quite opposed to uh, allowing it to stay in Serbia. So they're suggesting that uh, you know northern Kosovo secession from Kosovo is not permitted, even though technically they wouldn't actually secede because they're really a part of Serbia. So it's um, yeah, it's a big game of who's allowed to secede and who's who's not allowed. So it's uh, it's very strange. Um, and uh, yeah, difficult uh, uh, game they're playing. It's effectively yeah. similar as what's happening well, in Bosnia. Strange, uh, strange indeed. Uh, yeah, strange indeed, though, Glenn. Let's uh, let's, uh, as it were, uh, pan out a bit. Uh, who is allowed to secede and who is not allowed to secede? So Kosovo is allowed to secede, but Catalonia is not, uh, and Crimea is not. How do Western politicians and, and your academic colleagues square that circle? Because it frankly sounds absurd to the ordinary person. Yes, and well, it, it is absurd because what they effectively did was introduce this principle of self-determination, that this should be allowed to override uh, territorial integrity. So now you've introduced two competing concepts. You have territorial integrity or self-determination. and. Uh, well, which principle should it work and or or should it go with? And it turns out that, well, whatever power interests would dictate. So, for example, in Kosovo, we need uh, uh, secession. In Crimea, no, it's territorial integrity. In Taiwan, they're pushing towards secession. So it's all very much, uh, you know, presenting two different competing concepts and then and then uh, choosing the one that fits uh, their interests. So. Uh, people don't really appreciate how how devastating this uh, invasion was because after the invasion of uh, Yugoslavia in 1999, it was argued that it was uh, it was illegal. It was not legal, but it was legitimate, and this is quite extraordinary because this was the, when we decided to decouple legality from legitimacy. And one has to ask the question: and what makes something legitimate? Well, it turns out liberal democratic values. This is uh, again our vague uh, uh, reference to values and who represents it well it's the it's the nato countries the us and its allies so in other words uh, when making uh, this claim uh, it's the west that gives itself a prerogative to uh, create an exemption for itself in international law so you know we can interfere in the domestic affairs of other countries we can topple governments we can uh, invade we can change borders because now we are acting you know according to uh, liberal democratic values, which allows us to exempt us from the normal international law, which other countries have to follow. So whenever we talk about this rules-based international order, uh, this is what we're talking about, this sovereign inequality between states, and it has its foundation in what was done to, in Kosovo. Yes, which in turn flowed from the pen of uh, Mr. Tony Blair, and his Chicago doctrine uh, with his terrible twin, Bill Clinton. But here I'm detecting something that uh, I'm going to dive more deeply into on another occasion. But it does seem to me that in the Yugoslav war and the breakup of Yugoslavia, the British were far more uh, aggressive and determined uh, on war than the Americans were, that Blair was more hawkish than Clinton. Uh, ditto in the invasion of Libya, uh, where uh, Cameron and Sarkozy were quite a bit more a gung-ho for war than the Obama-Biden administration. And now we're seeing all that repeated again in the Ukraine, where Biden says, don't attack uh, inside Russia. Britain says, do attack inside Russia. It's perfectly legitimate to do so. Uh, in other words, maybe we need to recalibrate uh, our, uh, our, our fire on uh, the US-UK relationship. Maybe the UK is actually perfidious Albion. Uh, is more close to the heart of these world problems than we perhaps assumed in the past. 
Well, uh, you're correct that it was uh, Tony Blair who who argued that you know in this new era of uh, uh, liberal hegemony, he said we've moved b- beyond uh, the peace of Westphalia, which was you know the recognition of sovereign equality of states. Uh, and his uh, advisor Cooper, who argued, you know, we need the liberal empire again. Uh, we need to have a garden, uh, protect the garden from the jungle. So again, going very back back to this uh, imperialist uh, rhetoric now. Uh, but but you're very correct though with this uh, with the British. Uh, it's quite for me. It's uh, I'm not quite sure why why the British becomes uh, more hawkish than the United States. But it was also Tony Blair who, uh, after the Serbian t- television uh, criticized being bombed in 1999, he argued that this was uh, war propaganda, which justified bombing uh, the Serbian media. And uh, of course, thereafter, the Americans bombed uh, the Chinese embassy when they also complained. But we we see also the same now uh, in 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 Ukraine. Of course, it's very strange that it's always Britain who comes out the hardest. Uh, uh, they call for yeah, attacking inside the Russia. They're the one who's sending depleted uranium ammunition. They're the ones sending the long uh, range uh, uh, weapon systems. Uh, it's um, yeah, it's quite it's, it's it's quite interesting that this is yeah Britain on the front line. Yes, it may be a sort of me, me, me cry uh, now that we've left the European Union and we, we, we are desperate uh, for attention. Uh, but on the other hand, it's placing British people in some danger and their interests in very grave uh, danger. Uh, but as I say, I'll, I'll, I'm going to dive more deeply into that on another occasion. Back to, to Serbia for a minute, Professor. Uh, where does this go now? Vukic has stood down as the uh, leader of the ruling party in Serbia. Uh, There are elections. I think he's not going to contest them. Uh, There are big social movements uh, on all kinds of things, family values uh, and uh, and the issue of mass shootings and so on. There are a lot of currents at play inside Serbia. No Serbian leadership can afford to sell out Kosovo, can they? Any more than they can afford to, for example, sanction Russia. Uh, No government could survive in Serbia that did either of these two things, let alone both of these two things. No, I agree. And this is kind of the problem for Serbia. On one hand, um, no Serbian leader can, uh, well, uh, surrender Kosovo. Uh, on the other hand, they don't want a war with uh, NATO either. But uh, in my opinion, if 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 they're forced and pushed to a corner, I think that they would deploy a military force if required to protect the Serbs in uh, northern Kosovo. Uh, so it's um, my, my expectation. Or how how I see this is that uh, the Serbs will try. Uh, well, they have a in, strong incentive to walk this. Uh, well, to to well suit their relation the, the tensions if it's possible and i think that the benefit now is uh, that it appears that nato might uh, well that they also want to reduce tensions now uh, don't get me wrong i think that over the past month the nato countries have been quite responsible for provoking this because uh, for months now they've been putting immense pressure on serbia to make concession on the kosovo issue and also to force uh, serbia by the way to put sanctions on russia now, this is what the Serbian president has complained about for months uh, as well, that they never experienced this amount of pressure before. And even the U.S. ambassador to Serbia confirmed in March that the U.S. was making Serbia, uh, quote, pay a high price for its reluctance to impose sanctions on Russia. So the U.S. committed itself to keeping up the pressure on Serbia. And there's been also many publications in the West that this is an opportunity uh, now with the war in Ukraine that they can put a split between the Serbs and the Russians uh, as a condition for NATO to establish uh, an exclusive sphere of influence in the Western Balkans. So the reason why this has contributed to this escalation is, you know, how does the Kosovo Albanians re- re- react to this? Well, they saw that NATO has uh, well effectively given them uh, unconditional support since 99. And so now the authorities in Kosovo saw this as an opportunity to escalate, to cement their control over northern Kosovo. Uh, however, the Serbs in northern Kosovo pushed back and Serbia put its military on high alert on the other side of the border. So what we're actually seeing now for the first time is 
NATO countries, then especially the United States and France, uh, criticizing the government in Kosovo for having incited this conflict and also now pressuring and punishing them in order to de-escalate. So again, this is something entirely new. So I I, I don't see NATO wanting or can afford to uh, make this escalate into a war. Um, but again, they wanted to bring pain to the Serbs with max pressure. But uh, now that NATO seemingly wants to de-escalate, uh, it might be an opportunity um, if they're able to control uh, Kosovo, that is, because uh, the government there, you know, they've had uh, for the past, uh, yeah, since 99, they had uh, uh, effectively the assumption that NATO would uh, defend them or, or support them no matter what. So they haven't really had, ex they've expected that they uh, can get anything they want. So uh, this is also a new situation for them. And it remains to be seen if they are willing to yeah, de-escalate. Professor Glenn Deason, thank you as always for joining us with your wisdom and your eloquence uh, on this subject. Is Roger Waters being smeared? It's not changing. Uh, the numbers are going up. 12,000 people have voted. And more or less everybody believes that Roger Waters is being smeared. If you disagree, please call. 0808 in the UK and Ireland, plus 1844 in the US and Canada, and in the rest of the world, 44203 I'll be back in 60 seconds, can't we? The airwaves. This savannah is a rigid dichotomy of fact and fiction. As vicious as the Twitter sphere where the slightest misjudgment can spell being cancelled. One species rules over the airwaves through its ability to adapt and survive in even the harshest environments. The George Galloway. The top cat in these parts, it is mostly active on Sunday evenings in Britain and mid-afternoon in the United States. It seldom roars during the day. Most notable for its wide variety of headdress, it protects these parts from the mainstream media. You can catch this fine specimen on the mother of all talk shows. Don't pick a fight with it. They've been known to bite back. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Now, the mother of all public meetings is taking place in Galway in Ireland on the 22nd of June. It is a panel of speakers that you'd probably have to pay a lot of money to see any comparable level of talent assembled on the one stage, but this will cost you nothing at all. Uh, it's Claire Daly, member of the European Parliament, the Joan of Arc of uh, the European Parliament, Mick Wallace, equally a fiery Irish member of the European Parliament, George Galloway, me, Catherine Connolly, a member of the Irish Parliament, Catherine Connolly TD, who's an independent, and Mairead Farrell, TD, a Sinn Féin member of the Irish Parliament. The meeting is organised by Galway Alliance Against War, and its title is Neutrality, Not NATO. Something that you'd think had already been settled by Ireland being neutral by constitution. But everyone and their dog knows that Ireland sure ain't neutral in the great conflicts in the world, even in the Afghan and Iraq wars, 
whilst officially neutral, their airport at Shannon was being regularly used for the transshipment of uh, American belligerents uh, to go and fight in these wars, who would stop off and have a bit of R and R at Shannon. Uh, and also a very real uh, belief amongst many, including me, uh, that uh, black flights were touching down on Irish soil. That is to say, flights that were not recorded, were not official, never really happened. And these flights contained men being transferred to black sites, black prisons for torture, torture that the Americans were not prepared to do themselves. So you can imagine how vile that torture was. And uh, some of these flights undoubtedly went through Ireland. So Ireland is officially neutral, but in practice, not. And this public meeting is making the case uh, that I make as a co-founder of No to NATO, No to War. That NATO as a beast only exists for war, like the killer shark only exists to kill. So NATO only exists to make war. So that's Thursday, the 22nd of June. All roads lead to Galway, which is a very beautiful place. You'd be well advised to stay over and enjoy some of the weekend there. Thursday, 22nd of June. Venue to be confirmed. Uh, Patreon comments. Thanks for all my supporters on the Patreon couldn't do it without them. New patrons are Kenneth Chapman and Kath Shaw. Thank you very much to both of you. And a new Moats graduate, Diane Williams. Diane, thank you indeed for that. Uh, Morris McIntyre, one of my patrons, says, Re Roger Waters, I've followed his music since the 1980s. Waters has always been honest and follows his convictions. He has endured over the years, resulting in his ex-bandmates turning against him. He's a good man and has showed he has the courage to stand up against the establishment. Long live Pink Floyd, the real Pink Floyd. Thanks, Morris. Brilliantly written. And uh, Moats legend Graham Briggs White says, Roger Waters is an intelligent and conscientious man. Not the kind of thing they want or need at the moment. Says it all. Really well said, Graham. I mean, Roger could just be sitting back counting his scores, if not hundreds of millions. The fact that he's out there fighting for what he believes in, surely it's commendable, no? Or would you rather that he just sat and counted his hundreds of millions? James Butler, another patron, says, poor Serbia being punished for not blindly following the EU and US against Russia. It is an easy target for NATO again now and is being provoked into a possible conflict. Watch out for a terrorist attack somewhere in Serbia very soon, I fear. I'm sure they're watching out for that. And maybe not only in Serbia. We all love a Kosovan and an Albanian in Western Europe, don't we? Anna is in Italy on the world leaders. Go ahead, Anna. Sono in bagno. Anya, go ahead. Hello, hello. Um, yes, how wonderful well, to I, hear from you. It's lovely to hear from you too. I've missed you very much on RT since they took RT off, because uh, I used to watch uh -huh. you on RT, but um, it's very, very sad that uh, Thank you. it's not on, but um, yes. I do appreciate it. Well, this, this is much bigger. This show is oh. much, much bigger, so yes, uh, every is. cloud yes, has a is. silver lining. Oh, it does. Um, I wanted to say, last week you were talking about um, about these young um, political leader, leaders, and um, yes, yes. because we we have just recently changed our government to Georgia Maloney, and I think most mm. of these leaders they promise and they just deceive us, because we are yeah. very very uh, disappointed with Georgia Maloney. Um, especially yeah, with she's, her. Uh, meet the new boss, just the same as the old boss, only worse. It's worse because we've been deceived. But the thing is, she's a less um, 
uh, she, she's le- less than the 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 the, the, uh, the um, sinistra. It's all right. The um, uh, the left party is even worse. Say an Italian onion. Oh, it's okay. Right, yeah. <laughs> I'm, well, I've been living here for so long. I don't know whether I'm English or Italian. <laughs> I've been living here for so long. But what I wanted to say was, it is by deceit. And if you look at Zelensky, what did he say before he was elected? He said there was going to yeah. be peace. Yeah. So in the end... Exactly. He was I, the peace oh, candidate. Yes, he was. And look what he turned out to be. So I am just hoping that Maloney does change something, but I'm very, very disappointed with her and I think a lot of Italians are we are very disappointed yeah yeah she's definitely not the answer Uh, none of the others are the answer either and this is our central dilemma in Italy uh, in Germany in Britain in the United States although some hope might be on the horizon there in 24 with Bobby Kennedy jr for all his imperfections and uh, faults. Uh, In France, there is an alternative. Mélenchon is a genuine alternative. And he came within a whisker of being in the final ballot against Macron. Uh, It's a great pity that he wasn't. But uh, in your country and in mine, your old country, uh, in Italy and in Britain, I'm afraid uh, almost all hope is lost. Uh, because there are no bright lights uh, on the horizon, nothing coming through the tunnel, not even the lights of the oncoming train. Anya, thank you. Beautiful to talk to you in Italy. Juan is in California. Let's hear from him. Juan, welcome to the show. Hello, George. How are you doing? Um, say thank you so much for all your all your hard work and all the great guests that you thank have. You. And I just want to encourage, edify, and lift you up and just thank you. And we, you know, I'm sure I talk for, I'm talking for a lot of people on the live chat. Uh, we all miss Scott and we were glad to have him back and, and you, you know, you were one of the first ones to interview him. So that was awesome. So I just want, I, I don't have a question. Yeah, he's still, uh, Juan, he's, he's still banned from, from Twitter inexplicably. Uh, in fact, so much of this censorship is inexplicable. So that, for example, uh, my Belgrade video, an old one, uh, gets half a million views in 30 hours. Uh, The interview I did with Adil Raja uh, last uh, week, on Wednesday, I think, uh, and that's got half a million views. And yet, on YouTube, Adil Raja has 3,000 views. Half a million on one platform, 3,000 on YouTube. Now, you're not telling me that that's not being deliberately suppressed. Now, I've had a good uh, relationship with YouTube, but there's now increasing evidence that they are picking and choosing which of my videos they will allow to run free and which they will choke. Uh, I'm increasingly looking to rumble. Uh, I want to appeal to everyone to uh, watch me on rumble if you possibly can. Uh, I know that rumble isn't everywhere and people are not used to watching it but it's easy and I hope more and more people will watch this show and other work that I do on Rumble rather than anywhere else because of all the platforms that is the least uh, tyrannical in its attitude to censorship. But there's Scott Ritter one. He's an expert. He's an expert on war. He's an expert on weapons. He's an experienced uh, international figure as an arms inspector in the former Soviet Union in Iraq. You'd think people would want to hear his point of view, even if they disagreed with it. And yet they, they hunt him. They, they, they hunt him down. They try and cancel him. It's madness, one. Right. 
Anyway, thanks very much for the call and for your kind words. Much appreciated in sunny California. Email from Patrick Fox. He asks, is Moats available in Cuba? Uh, I don't know what social media is available in Cuba, uh, but I'll certainly check, Patrick, and uh, report back. Uh, Nasri Akil, a long-standing supporter, sends 20 Canadian dollars and says, George, the truth is that World War II still continues today and the initiation of the CIA's Operation Aerodynamic in 1945 marked the beginning of this proxy war in Ukraine against Russia. Well said, Nasri. David is in Swindon on the BBC. David, what would you yeah, like yeah, to two say? Yeah, yeah, two points on the BBC. The first one is on that uh, beluga whale. I just can't stop laughing when I read the headline. Yeah. The alleged... I mean, if you put it's, the uh, the, uh, the, the yeah, the eight words. Yeah, alleged. Order. Alleged. Alle yeah. yeah. I've got alleged, alleged in case, it, in case it's sued. Yeah, it's alleged. Former. <laughs> alleged. And it's a former. And if you put the word spotted yeah. as well, I didn't know there was a spotted, spotted beluga whale, but it was spotted off the coast of Sweden. And when I, when I, when I was younger, we used to have a well, little uh, thing called Flipper. Do you remember Flipper? The dolphin? Yeah, I remember Flipper, the dolphin. <laughs> it yeah. looks like that in that picture, yeah. It That's what was, it looks it like. It does, yeah, it, it does, like it. it does. But let's run through it. Let, let's, let's swim by this again, David. It is a former Russian spy will. Do they have evidence of its resignation or yeah. its dismissal from the service? Mm -hmm. How yeah. do you define a will as a former spy? <laughs> I know. How do you know it's Russian. Has it got snow on its flippers? A vodka yeah. <laughs> bottle in its gills, maybe? Yeah. How yeah. do you know it's Russian? How do you uh, know it's I a know spy? Why. And tell me. Because they saw it near the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. It was, it was that that planted the thing. It was Flipper that did it. <laughs> was it? Yeah, he planted the well, explosive. I'll tell you what. Apparently, the Australian media was even worse. They said that these whales get lonely and that it had it was a kind of honey trap that the Russians had set for this whale. They found a lonely whale and they lured it into their secret service in one of these honey trap uh, operations. That's what the official state mouthpiece <coughs> in Australia said happened. But yeah, it's, just it's a, this former that gets me. Go on. Yeah, but the, the other thing was, again, on the second point on the BBC, tonight on the um, five o'clock news, which always wind, gets me wound up, they had a, a, a retired general, American general, okay, pontificating on Ukraine and the spring offensive. And what he was saying was that the spring offensive, when it comes, when the ground's dried out, they would break through through to like Mariupol and split it in two so they cut off Crimea yeah yeah right yeah yeah that's what it, now he was saying what we needed to do and this is where I thought I recognize him this general was saying we need to do exactly what we did when we hit Baghdad in the shock and awe and then I looked at his name this was General Petraeus on the BBC wow. Can you believe it? Didn't he get sacked in disgrace? Yeah, he was the As one corrupt, that did the shock and awe. A corrupt yeah. fornicator. He yeah. A corrupt fornicator who was That's drummed him. out he, of the services. Did did the did the uh, the BBC make that point? Uh, no, they were just like in awe of him. Well, shock and awe. They were like saying, and he was uh, saying, yeah, we need to blast uh, through like we did in Baghdad, straight through, cut off Mariupol, split them in two. And then I looked at him and I thought, with your record, Fab. oh, I oh know. Anyway, that was it. So that's the BBC or that's all I wanted yeah, to say. Yeah, let them in. Uh, yeah, well, you said it very well. And you got my blood uh, running faster. And I'm grateful to you for that. You know, one part of me wants them to go ahead with this kind of thing. Uh, I can't help thinking that this empire needs a beating. Uh, so when I hear them threatening 
but they're going to do this and going to do that. One part of me screams silently, usually. Come on then. Come on right ahead. As you would when, when, a, when a drunken, belligerent fool is threatening you in a, in a pub car park. Sometimes the best thing to say is, come on, right ahead, square go, you and me, right now. Maybe that's just my age and class. Stephen is in Middlesbrough, wants to talk about Ukraine. Go ahead, Stephen. Hello, George. Um, yeah, just on the war, I mean, I, I'll be honest, I, I don't agree with you all much, but on the war, I uh, welcome your scepticism on it, because for me now, I'm just a simple lad, George. I'm more expert at anything I don't profess to be, but it's either one way or the other. You've got to have and support arm in Ukraine or you're a Putin stooge or whatever. For me, that's how the debate's been framed, and I, I, I just think it's... Yeah, it's, yeah. But, it's but you're old enough to remember, Stephen, uh, when that was exactly what was said in the run-up to the Iraq war. But now, 20 years later, you cannot find anybody, not anybody at all, who will claim that the Iraq war was right, that it was the right thing to do. None of them. I was at the Oxford Union, as I mentioned earlier. Ben Wallace ran away, didn't turn up, uh, but he sent uh, nice but dim, uh, what's his uh, name? I forget his name, but nice but dim head of the Defence Select Committee or whatever. Uh, his name will come back to me. Uh, and there were, there were, yeah, no, not Tugendhat, no, much dimmer than him. I mean, really dim, dropped on his head dim. Uh, graduate of Loughborough Physical Education College, uh, which of course qualifies him to run our nation's defences. Um, uh, his name will come back to me. Someone will put it on my screen. Anyway, point is, neither he nor any of the generals present in the debate would now defend the Iraq war. And some claim to have opposed it at the time. I never noticed it, uh, being one of the leaders of the anti-war movement. You'd think I might have, but I didn't notice it. So the, my point, Stephen, is this. I was called a Saddam stooge. Except I turned out to be right. And all the people who called me a Saddam stooge turned out to be wrong. So what does a logical person infer from the trustability of the analysis of me or them? Are you going to uh, go with the, the guys that got it wrong before? They were wrong before, but they're right now. Or the guy who was right then, is he not likely to be right now? You see my point, Stephen? 100%, George, and you've got the likes of uh, the left-wing supporter of every war going and nuclear weapons, Paul Mason and that plane judging jury on people judging them, saying that the Putin apologists and other unhinged characters like that, and that's the danger of it. It's just been, yeah. it's, it's just there straight away. You've got to pick a side. I'm not on anyone's side in this well, I think it, we need this negotiated settlement like all wars end, George. And, and I think it's a disaster for yep. the ordinary people of Russia and Ukraine. Uh, as you're right. Uh, you're absolutely right. A pleasure talking to you, Stephen. Uh, it's Toby Elwood was the uh, nice but dim character I was thinking of. Toby by name, Toby by nature. Uh, now, the Belgrade video on Twitter has been watched in the last 28 hours 507,200 times. Now that's power. There it is there. There it is there. The biggest, fastest growing clip from Moat on record. Well done to you, Gayatri, not just for making it, but for having the foresight to refloat it on this auspicious day. Thanks very much. Linda is in Clackmannanshire in Scotland. Let's hear from her. Linda, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Gallery. I just, I don't know if you know, um, but today I managed to get a phone call from my son. Uh, he lives in Ukraine. His wife's Ukrainian. And while he was on the phone, a message came through on, on his phone that 
as from tomorrow, they are going to be doing a full, um, what do you call it when they recruit, deployment in Maine. But now... Yeah, yeah, mobilization, yeah. Mobilization, that's it. But now they're going for workers. They're taking the workers away. And they're going to send them. Does and that the include state. your son? Does that no, include no, your no. son? No, he's Scottish. No, no, they, they can't take him. Yeah, but he's there. I, I would, you know, I, I hope Aye, not. I know, I know. You better, I have, t- you, I, better, uh, you better check that with the embassy. They're taking, well, they're taking anything with a pulse. Well, that's it. They're even taking disabled folk. And they actually say it in this text message. So the men mm. are running, but the laddies are running scared. They don't know. There's no way for them to hide. They can't get out. But if they pay the government no. 10, 10, what's it, 10,000 grievner, they'll let them go out of the country. 10,000. You, you can do a runner to, Mar- to Marbella Aye. and let the poor bloody infantry get slaughtered. That speaks volumes, Linda, about their character. Uh, but I did see something that is beginning. And I've now seen two uh, films of it, uh, of people turning on these press gang uh, gangs uh, that are going around the streets of Ukraine, literally pouncing on people and dragging people off to war violently, aggressively. I've now seen two examples of the public turning on the press gang and knocking their weapons out of their hands kicking them to the ground, giving them a doing, as we would say in Scotland, and the boys making off. Uh, It's hardly any wonder that not many people want to be the last soldier dying for Zelensky before he dashes off to one of his many multi-million pound homes in sunnier climes. Linda, uh, don't be a stranger. Keep us up to date with that story. Thanks for calling. Uh, An email from Annie Boylan uh, to our email address, which is onair at moats.tv. Annie says, Randy Critico, I'm told, is back on Twitter, but I believe that Scott Ritter is still suspended. Love, Annie. Indeed, uh, Scott is undoubtedly suspended, but a big hello to my dear friend, my bosom buddy, Randy Critico, who is back after a completely undeserved period in the slammer uh, of uh, Twitter jail. Fra is in Belfast on Kosovo. Go ahead, Fra. Hey, George. I'm going to talk about Kosovo, if you don't mind, via Beirut. Uh, I'm just back from a conference there. It was a global gathering in support of the Axis of Resistance, uh, and it was held for four days in Beirut. Uh, As you know, a very beautiful city by the sea. The uh, people Mm. at the conference, you know, represented, uh, there were various groups, including the uh, popular mobilization units in Iraq. There were people from Iran, people from Lebanon, uh, people from Syria, representing some of the government and foreign uh, departments. And among the people that were attendees was a lady from Serbia. So I got the chance to uh, chat to her, uh, Dragana was her name. And she was telling me part of the history, uh, obviously, of the breakup of Yugoslavia and the attack on Serbia and what's happening in Kosovo today. Now, she has absolutely no time for the present administration in Serbia. And some of the things she told me along the lines of, you know, that the Kosovo Liberation Army had originally been designated as a terrorist organization by the USA, and was then de-designated as such. And and by Britain. And by Britain. Robin Cook designated the Kosovo Liberation Army as a terrorist organization before turning our air force over to them. And very much like what's happening in Ukraine, they then used the Kosovo Liberation Army in a proxy war against Serbia. And she was telling me that it was really when the Serbian military security apparatus, uh, including the Serbians in Kosovo, and were on the point of crushing the Kosovo Liberation Army that NATO then stepped in. Its proxy was being defeated, and NATO then stepped into the breach 
in order to save them and then went on to bomb Belgrade. But she told me an interesting thing, George, uh, and I have no reason to doubt her. She's a very intelligent and very, very well-placed person politically. Uh, she, she said that Kosovo only has like 5,000 combat troops and it was something to do with, I don't know if it was a peace deal with NATO or what came out of it, but they are limited in the amount of soldiers that they can have uh, at arms. And she also said that the Serbian government was sending uh, munitions to Ukraine and it also supplied Saudi Arabia for ISIS in Syria. So while I like a lot of politicians say things in public, in the background, there's all these Machiavellian machinations uh, and how they, how they appear in secret to be carrying out what she considered to be American policy in the region. So just wonder what you thought of that. I, I, I don't believe that. Uh, I don't believe that that's true of the Serbian government, though, of course, I'm familiar with the accusation. Uh, if Send us her, her details. Dragana, if she's a good speaker in English, and we'll, we'll get her on the show, Fra. Thanks uh, very much for that report, uh, drawing the absolute parallels that exist between uh, the Kosovan question and the Ukrainian question. Michael is in Washington on the issue of world leaders. Let's hear what Michael thinks of them. Go ahead, Mike. Thank you, George. Uh, uh, firstly, uh, the uh, Brits being more hawkish, that's a uh, Terry Thomas protocol, isn't it? One-upmanship, I think. Yeah, uh, one-upmanship uh, in a very deadly way, uh, making yeah. our people uh, the number one villain in the world. That was your job, Michael. Uh, in the United States, but at least you're protected by the Atlantic Ocean up to a point uh, hitherto. Uh, but we're not protected at all. Uh, we're a sitting duck, a sitting target, uh, with no means uh, to defend ourselves beyond, if America allowed us, unleashing uh, nuclear weapons, bringing about the complete end of our country. Some defense, that is. Uh, go on, Mike. Well, these so-called leaders, uh, I have two brief questions. One is that, is it possible, and you've known a lot of these guys, is it possible that in their elderly, elderly age and in their positions of power, that they have it as a fantasy in their mind playing out that if they eliminate young men, they're going to gain the, uh, co you know, limited competition and gain the admiration of young women? Is that a possibility? Well, uh, Joe Biden uh, likes them young, uh, preferably children. Uh, so who knows what goes on in the minds of these people? Uh, I, I think in the case of the British, uh, it is a bit of me, me, me. Uh, look at me. Uh, these European Union backsliders are all umming and eyeing, and on the one hand, but on the other, maybe we better be careful and so on. Uh, so the British run out in front of the Americans and say, look at me, uh, I'm ready to go even farther than you. Uh, and it may be as pathetic as that. It really may be. It certainly can't come from any calibration of Britain's national interest. That is uh, the complete opposite of Britain's national interest. Uh, it cannot be because we think we could fight and win against Russia, against China, against both of them together. Uh, it cannot possibly be that unless they've forgotten about these long ago events in Afghanistan uh, just a year or so ago uh, when the Americans slunk out like a thief in the night from Afghanistan, the British having already slunk. Uh, we couldn't beat guys in sandals on bicycles with Kalashnikovs, but we can beat hypersonically nuclear armed superpowers. I right, as we say in Scotland. Michael, thanks for the uh, call. Uh, a legend is on the line. Clear the lines, it's Norma in Bristol. Go ahead, Norma. Hello, George. Um I didn't really mean to phone again, you know, so it's 
quickly, but I'm a bit worried. You're always um, welcome. Always welcome. On, <laughs> on the news today, um, they were talking about these Ukrainian children, many of them, that um, have been evacuated to Russia to supposedly summer camps, mm-hmm. and then later their families had to travel miles and miles to get them back, and they didn't all come back. And I want to know what this is all about, because basically it's... I wouldn't have thought it was altruistic to do that, and, you know, it's been a bit concerning, really. Um, have you heard well, what, about I, it? I'm not sure. Yeah, I know that, Yeah, I know the story. I mean, maybe they're training the children to be handle... Handle uh, Baluja will form our spy wills. Uh, I mean, we really are getting into the realms of the ridiculous now, Norma. Why would Russia want to kidnap Ukrainian children? Why? For what purpose? What? Children yeah. are not going to be able to fight in the war or work in the factories or... I mean, what would be the point of it? It is such base, vulgar, childish propaganda that it's amazing yep. that anyone believes it. But, Norma, yep. they do. They do believe it. George. Hello? Okay. Yeah. You. Sorry. No, I'm um, saying they do believe it. Yeah, but you see, the thing is, they showed these parents and people traveling miles and miles and they got their children back and they were very concerned about them being taken in the beginning. And it was all pictured on the news. So it's bound to be true, isn't it? No, it's not bound to be true. How can you say that after listening to me all these years, Norma? Of course it's not bound to be true. This is a propaganda psychological war that we are in. These stories are psyops. And if even a wise and dedicated woman like you says it's bound to be true, that proves that it's working, Norma. Think. Yeah, but- we'll talk later. I've got, to make, oh. I've got to make way for another legend. You know, you're not the only legend, you know. But uh, Tommy in Glasgow, from our diplomatic wing, wanted to have the last word, but we haven't been able to get him. Tommy, call back. Uh, Bigfoot on YouTube says, first we had Chinese spy balloons, now we have a former Beluga Russia spy whale. That former that gets me. Next we'll get Chinese spy Big Macs. Well, this Russian fertilizer is, of course, fertilizing everything. How do we know? that that fertilizer doesn't place surveillance equipment in the Brussels sprouts that will be on our dinner tables come Christmas time. How do we know that? Russian fertilizer, up to no good. Now the uh, poll results uh, are overwhelming. Is Roger Waters being smeared? 88%, 95%, 97%, 95 percent. 12,302 people voted across all platforms. Roger, you are vindicated as if you needed it. You're a great man and you deserve uh, all the love that is coming your way from good people uh, all over the world. Now, I was expecting Tommy on the line or I wouldn't have had to cut Norma short. Norma, please forgive me. It was a clash of two legends, but uh, Tommy has disappeared. I'm very sorry about that. I feel very strongly about the media, as you know, but I feel strongly that we're really on to something. I gave you the viewing figures for the last seven days. This is on a budget so small that you would laugh if I told you what it was. You would laugh that this show with that audience could be built by that amount of money. 
And so when I saw somebody called George Galloway had won £300,000 on a scratch card and started to get newspaper calls to ask if it was me, I thought to myself, well, good luck to the George Galloway in Glasgow that won £300,000 on a scratch card, which I had described at the time. They were launched as the crack cocaine of the gambling business, a view to which I hold. But it was quite funny that everybody thought that it was me that had won it. That man in Glasgow called George Galloway has probably had problems over his life having that name and I. I'm sorry if that is true, but my point is, somebody would back me. What could we build this into? What could we build this mother of all talk shows format, brand, into when we've got more than two and a quarter million people watching the show over seven days on virtually nothing, with no investment, with virtually no income. Just think what we could do if we had an anti-war chest. If you're out there and you've won a scratch card fortune, or if you're out there and you have a business that you'd quite like to be showcasing to such a large audience, please write to me at onair at moats.tv. There he is, Glasgow couple. Say their £300,000 win has left them in complete shock. Congratulations, Mr. and Mrs. Galloway. Uh, it couldn't have been us because we don't do it. So I'm glad that it was you. If you are out there and you can help build this Moats brand, just think what we could achieve. Because I'm not satisfied with two and a quarter million. I won't be satisfied until all over the world People are making a regular date to sit down live and watch the mother of all talk shows on Wednesdays and on Sundays. I'll be back, God willing, on Sunday at the earlier time, please note, of 7 p.m. UK time, where we'll be across all these burning issues and bringing you the best guests and guests that you'll never find on the BBC even sitting on the back of a Baluja whale. Good night. <laughs>